Okay, uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Caleb Danladi, as you're all aware. So today we'll be discussing about uh, ship handling, squats, and uh, interaction if time permits. So I remember the last time I was here, somebody asked a question regarding mooring and uh, anchoring. So ship handling is still part of uh, mooring. So this is going to be an uh, interactive uh, classes. If you have any question, you can stop me as we go along. And then if you want me to clarify something, you can as well uh, stop me in the course of the lecture. I might not be able to see your hand when you are waving, but please just unmute and just uh, stop me right away. So uh, I believe all of us here are navigators and we're all familiar with uh, ship, the concept of uh, ship handling. So before the ship gets to port, there are certain preparations that uh, the deck officer will have to make before arrival. And uh, part of those preparation includes uh, mooring uh, lines preparation. You know, some companies you have to, as good practice of seamanship, you have to undertake what we call a uh, pre uh, mooring briefing or a meeting between crew where you tend to explain to them how the mooring is going to take place. Springs first, followed by uh, you have the breast lines, then the headlines, all those ones will be discussed. And also part of the preparation is to prepare the steering gear, you know, deck preparation and so on. But what we are going to discuss now is slightly different from that. We are going to discuss about uh, ship handling, how you, how you feel the vessel when you are in confined waters, restricted waters, or even in open seas. So uh, you might have a certificate of competency, but how confident do you feel to handle a ship in confined waters or heavy waters? It's a question to everyone. Do anyone, I know the guys in supply vessel will be more confident, Captain Afolabi and the rest that have very good ship handling experience. So, but for those of you guys that have been in LNG and uh, very large crude oil tankers, and you have not, you are not a master yet. How confident are you to handle a ship in confined waters? Anyone? Or who has ever handled a ship in confined waters? Apart from uh, steering, I don't mean like uh, when you are getting your steering certificate time, you actually handling it, looking at the effect of wind, current, seas, and other dynamics of the uh, ocean. Anyone? Okay, then let's move on. So, first thing uh, in ship handling, it's very, very important for you to know the quality of a good uh, ship handler. What are the qualities of a good ship handler? Very, very important. A ship handler must have a good awareness of wind and weather because if you are handling ships, it's very, very important for you to know where the wind is coming from and uh, the type of weather you are experiencing. Is it a restricted visibility? Where is the current, the direction of current, the tides? And for those of you guys who have been in West African waters, you are aware of the soliton, the rip tides, the one that goes, you see horizontally moving, which can easily turn the head of vessel at over 180 degrees within 10 minutes. So it's very, very important for a ship handler to know wind. And as you are aware, wind is measured from the direction where it is uh, always uh, coming from. You say, okay, the wind is coming from Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, while current is the direction is heading to. So the current is setting Southeasterly, Southwesterly, so it's very, very important for you to have a good idea of wind, current, and tides. And the very, very most important thing is the vessel characteristics. So as a pilot, when you get to a vessel first, 
you are going to find out, okay, is it a right-handed propeller? Is it a left-handed propeller? Uh, what is the stopping distance? You need to go and check the maneuvering characteristics of the vessel, the turning cycle, advance, transfer. We are going to discuss this in our subsequent uh, lectures. So you need to know the vessel characteristics. You need to know when you stop the vessel now, how many cables is the vessel going to move? You also need to know when you are turning, what is the uh, advance, what is the transfer of the vessel, you know, so that all those are you are going to take it into account when maneuvering, you know. So you also need to know the amount of cycle when it is in bias condition, load condition is very, very important. So I think the qualities of a good ship handler is ability to work in a team. Very, very important. When you are in a bridge, you work that as a team. Whether you are a star, a chief officer, officer of the watch, you should be able to work together as a team. And what I mean here is condition is a key. You cannot work alone. You can seek advice. There's, there's, uh, there's what we do when we are piloting. And what you do is uh, you report, you know, you give the captain or the pilot situation report. You give him the heading, you know, the setting to the right, to the left, you know, the speed, you know, which boy you are passing through and all those things. So that is one of the qualities of a ship handler, working together as a team. And another thing is ability to stay calm. I know when we are all on the ship, Sometimes when you encounter a close quarter situation, people cannot be able to handle pressure. So a good quality of a ship and is to stay calm when things go wrong and be able to, you know, react quickly to back the ship uh, on track. So those are the good qualities of a ship handler. So they are the qualities that you must adopt if you want to be a good ship handler or a very good uh, pilot. So you can see the ship is moving in the water, but what influences the ship? You know, what are the things that influence the ships? We have the internal, the external, and the other variables. So the internal, you have to talk about the trust. Trust, we are talking about the engine now when you are giving the engine power. So when you go on dead slow ahead, the vessel is going to move ahead. Dead slow as 10, the vessel is going to move as 10. And it's very important for you to know the position of pivot point. So we are going to discuss about that. So when the vessel is lying still in the water, the pivot point is in the center. So meaning that that is the center of rotation. And when the vessel moved, is moving ahead, the pivot point moved to one quarter of the length of the vessel forward. So that is sometimes if you are approaching a bird, the first thing you do is you give hard over then engines. You know, as you give hard over, you give engine, you, you have a quick turn, you know? So it's very, very important for you to know this. Then we have the external factors. The external factors have to do with wind, as we have discussed. Uh, you also have to be careful of interaction. You know, you know the recent issue with the ever given in Swartz Canal you know, that uh, it became a headline in all the international dailies. So it's very, very important. That is why we are going to discuss about uh, interaction. Then we have some variable influence which have to do with the shape of the hull, the type of the hull, you know, the type of the propeller, whether it's a twin screw or a single screw uh, vessel. So what are the principles of uh, ship handling? Very, very important before you handle any ship, you need to know the principle of a ship handling. And uh, generally a ship handler doesn't have to be a pilot. Even the officer of watch, you know, you begin to gain the characteristics of ship handling from when you are a cadet, you tend to build it up to when you are officer of the watch and chief officer, then get about you are a master because some, some ports, they give you a, uh, you know, you don't require a pilot to take ship in and out of some port. For instance, now if you are going to Singapore for bunker, sometimes you might not have pilot. You'll be given a position to anchor. So if you don't know how to handle a ship, there you have some issues in, uh, in anchoring that particular uh, vessel. So 
very, very important before any betting operations or before any anchoring operations, you must have a plan. Having a plan is crucial for the success of every operation. For instance, now you can't just uh, start moving from maybe let's say Lagos to uh, Antwerp or Lagos to Cape Town without a passage plan. So a plan will be able to guide you. You must be able to have a plan of what to do. You must be able to have a plan of when to reduce speed. You must be able to have a plan of when to use two steering motors. You must be able to have a plan of when to call a second watch keeper on the bridge. You must be able to have a plan of when to put the engines on standby. You must be able to have a plan of when you are going to be on red condition. That means the master must be on the bridge. You must be able to have a plan to say, okay, this is the pilot uh, position. So it's very, very uh, crucial. Secondly, you must be able to anticipate how the ship will behave. And that will help you in carrying on the plan. For instance, if you are coming to West Africa, you know the predominant wind, you know, in this season of the year, not the Hamatan season, is mostly south, south, southwest, southwesterly. So you should be able to anticipate what will happen. You know, you should be able to know uh, the wind direction, where the wind is coming from. If you don't have the local knowledge, what will help you, you need to go to Admiralty sailing directions. It gives you some local information, routine charts, it gives you the local information. And also the current weather forecast. You have weather forecast for the next 28 and uh, 48 hours. It's very, very important. It's very, very uh, crucial. And if you are approaching a belt, let's say an SBN, so you should be able to see what other ships that are at anchor are doing. You should be able to anticipate the direction of the current. Sometimes you may ask the top board, okay, lie along the current in direction of the host and just give me the direction. So thereafter you anticipate where the current is coming, uh, is, is, is setting to, is very, very important. Uh, quality of a good uh, principle of a good ship handler. So another very, very important uh, principle is controlling the ship speed. You know, another thing is you should not be able to go too fast and you should not be able to go too slow. You know, sometimes you should be able to have some slight speed to be able to have enough momentum to move. So it's very, very important. If you go too fast, when things go wrong, you are in deep trouble especially if you are doing SBM betting, you know, where you need to approach at a very, very slow and controlled uh, speed. So it's very, very important. Sometimes you have to control your speed so that you can uh, uh, approach the bat without using much engines. If you go to some ships, like I said, the good quality of a ship and live, I go to a ship now, I'll ask the captain, oh, hello captain, uh, what is the maximum uh, number of consecutive starts in your engine because you know for ships that are motor engines they have the number of air starts and if you exhaust the air what are you going to do is when you are you are in an emergency situation at that point because you're already in port you know you are approaching the bird you are going to hit the bird so you should be able to know the maximum number of kicks on the engine you should not be able to know the critical rpms of that particular uh, engine so i've talked about uh, too much speed you know very, very important, going slowly and methodologically yields better result, as we have said, you know, slow and steady. You shouldn't be going too fast, you know. So it's uh, very, very uh, important for you to know that. <laughs> so I have a question for all of you. So what makes uh, ships to turn? You know, some of you might say, Aurora. Well, the answer is wrong. So there has been debate on this. Uh, if you go to Nautical Institute, there is a comprehensive uh, article about what makes ships to turn, you know, and uh, Nautical Institute, if any one of you need it, you can contact me, I can, as a member, I can be able to get you those particular uh, journals. So the answer is absolutely no, it's not the rudder. So what actually caused the hull to turn is the water pressure around the hull. You know, and the difference between the water pressure to port and starboard actually makes it to turn. So by using the rudder, you are able to control its uh, the movement of the direction. Let's give you for example. Now the ship is an, in an idle situation; it's stopped; it's not moving. You are not using the rudder. 
So what happened now? Sometimes you see you are setting to the left, to the port side, you are setting to the starboard side. If you are facing north, setting to the north, setting to the south, without actually using rudder. So that is the effect of water pressure. It's actually the water pressure that is making the hull to turn. So what happened is that by using the rudder, you are being able to control this uh, pressure differential to steer the ship. So that's the reason why, that's what makes the ships uh, to uh, turn. It's uh, very, very important for you to know. So uh, you can't talk about ship handling without uh, discussing uh, pivot point, you know? And uh, what is pivot point? So pivot point is a position on the ship, which the ship rotates when turning. Like I said earlier, it's a center of rotation, you know? In calm situation, when the ship is even keel, you know, and when the ship is stopped, completely stopped and even keel, the pivot point is at the center. So at the center, it can be able to uh, turn, you know, it's right at midship when the vessel is stopped. So this pivot point, it moves. It moves when you are going ahead, one quarter of the length of the vessel when you are going ahead, and one quarter when you are going astern. So sometimes that is why when you tend to, when you are going ahead and you give it, uh, when you give him hard to port or hard to starboard with a slight speed, you tend to move, you, you know, and the effect is minimal when you are going uh, astern because the center has now moved uh, to one quarter of the length of the vessel uh, astern. So let's see, let's look at pivot point when you are making a headway. When you are making headway, what happened? There are two forces that act on the vessel. First, one, the first force is the forward motion of the ship because the ship is moving forward, as you can see here. The second one is the resistance to move forward created by the pressure because you have already uh, kicked the engine ahead. You are trying to move ahead another force. And there's also a resistance from the water, you know, created by the water that stops the ship from moving ahead. So if you are at a steady speed, the pivot point is going to move one quarter of the ship's length forward. So you can see it here, you have already kicked ahead and then the first force is the direction going forward. The second force is the water pressure, the direction coming and the pivot point here, the center of rotation is at the pivot point. So you, when, you, when you give the rudder hard to port, it tends to move hard to starboard, you know, with a bit of uh, engine movement. So what do you do if you want to, maybe you're approaching an SBM now, and then you are going steady at 12 o'clock, the SBM boy is at 12 o'clock, and suddenly because of uh, current, changes in current, then you find out that the SBM is at maybe one o'clock, and you want to bring the vessel to 12 o'clock. What you need to do you now is, you may, if depend on the speed, if the speed is, very, very low, less than 0.5 knot. You give it hard to start out, dead slow ahead. When it start moving ahead, you reduce it to east to 20, you know? East to 20, when you get some momentum, it's beginning to come, midship uh, stop engines. And then when it is there, then uh, you midship the wheel. And sometimes you have to keep counteracting uh, you have to keep the wheel on either hard to port or hard to starboard, depend on how the vessel have the tendency to move to port or to starboard. So this is uh, the position of pivot point when you are making a uh, headway. So what happened when you are making stainway? When you are making stainway now, there are still two forces that are act. You know, the astern motion and also the resistance motion created by water, you know? So, at steady speed, you know, the pivot point will move approximately, like I said, one quarter of the ship length uh, from uh, a stem, as you can see it particularly in this, in, in this uh, ship's uh, diagram. So it's very, very important for you to know the pivot point because the pivot point helps you to maneuver the ship because the center of rotation of uh, the vessel when moving ahead or a stem and when it is, uh, line idle is at a midship of the vessel. So uh, you, we have talked about uh, turning levers, you know, which have to do with the shifting of the pivot point. When you kick ahead, the pivot point is moved. So the shifting of the pivot point has an effect on turning forces that influence the ship. 
as we have said, you know, there are turning forces that influence the ship. Like I said, when you are moving ahead, you know, when you are moving and staying. So what are the turning forces? I've already talked about rudder here. When you go hard to port and uh, hard to starboard and think that's why you use, you know, to control the direction of the ship by steering, you know, you have rudder. You know, you also have a transverse thrust. You know, sometimes when you are going ahead, you know, you find out that in the right-handed propeller, the bow, you know, will be going to port. And sometimes when you are going and stand, you have the bow will have the tendency to go to starboard. So that's what we call uh, the effect of transverse thrust. We are going to talk about it in detail in our next class. You know, uh, the bow thruster to do with bow thruster, you know, there are ships that have bow thruster. Bow thruster is very effective when the ship is uh, going at less than uh, five uh, knots. You know, it's very, very important. You also have torque forces. Torque forces are critical because they help you in positioning the ship, you know, when going alongside. You know, sometimes even when you are going to SBM button, you know, when you when you uh, tend to tether the torque, you know, that means you make fast the torque before approach. It helps you to be able to still uh, have some sort of uh, keeping your engine on this slow ahead for a long period of time at minimal speed, which enable you to steer effectively. So torque forces are very, very uh, crucial. So another issue is the forces of interaction, which we are going to discuss as, as we are aware of interaction, it has to do with a uh, prejudice issue. Interaction occur when you have head-on situation. Inter you can have interaction between bank in narrow channel, also when overtaking. So it's very, very important for you to know that. So wind and tide, we have also discussed about that uh, at the beginning of uh, the class. So in uh, summary, you know, pivot point, uh, like I said, is a point about which uh, the ship rotates, you know, and the position moves if the vessel is moving ahead or staying. And you are aware that the position of pivot point affects the turning lever, you know, and the turning lever, the forces applied to ships to induce the turn. And the turning force may be affected by rudder, torques, you know, wind, trim of the vessel at times, interaction, or uh, talks. So it's very, very important for you to know that uh, pivot point and the effect of uh, pivot point because that is the foundation of uh, ship handling. So do you have any question uh, regarding pivot points, turning lever, or characteristics of a good ship handler? Any question? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, you know, from, from the turning point, from the turning lever, sir, you may mention of the torque force. Yes. And I'm beginning begin to get on this. What is torque doing? Okay. Because I'm the one handling the person now. So what's torque doing there? Okay, uh, the torque force I mean here is, uh, okay, when you are going into a port, let's assume you are going to a papa port now. So some, oh, let me give you an example. Uh, in a bon, in bonnie uh, port, so you need to there's a turning basin where you need to turn the vessel. If you are going port side or starboard, you need to turn the vessel in a turning basin. So sometimes along you, uh, to turn that vessel within a turning basin that is limited, you need torques. So sometimes before approaching port, you make fast torque forward, center lead forward. Sometimes you make fast the torque center lead aft. And this talks helps you to push the vessel, you know, to position the vessel alongside. So that's what I mean by uh, torque forces. That means there are external forces that have been uh, applied by torques that helps the turning lever in turning the vessel uh, alongside. If you have ever seen uh, an SBM mooring, you know, when you moor a vessel to SBM, you have a torque ascent. And what the torque does is to help positioning the vessel, you know, because you are always lying against the current, but sometimes there are tendency that you might move forward. So the torque tends, you have to increase the torque power, you know, by increasing the torque power, you know, you tend to hold position. If you are going into a port now and you cast, you are, you are leaving the port and you, you cast off your lines, the torque helps you to push, pull you out of that. So that's what I mean by uh, torque uh, 
forces. So I hope this uh, clarifies your question. Pleasure. Uh, is there any other question, any doubt before we move further? So uh, it's very, very, like I said earlier, it's very, very important for you to know the turning cycle of your ship. You know, that you need to know what is advanced, what is transfer. You know, you need to know stopping distance is very, very important because that might come up during your oral uh, examination. You know, you need to know the stopping distance. You need to know the bow visibility. You know, it's all posted there in the wheelhouse. So it's very, very important for you to know that because those are the foundations of uh, uh, a good uh, ship handler. We are also going to discuss about uh, rudders, you know, different uh, types of rudders, you know, uh, in our subsequent uh, lectures. You know, we are also going to discuss about the effect of transverse thrust, which you are aware. And then you know nowadays you have right-handed, left-handed propellers. So most ships that have been on are right-handed propellers. And when you are going ahead in a right-handed propeller, you know, the bow have tendency to go to port, you know, but it's in theory, in practice, in practice, sometimes it's not right. Sometimes you go to a ship that is right-handed and then the captain will tell you, oh, pilot, uh, sometimes when you are going ahead, it has a tendency to go to starboard. Or, you know, it has a tendency, or it doesn't go anywhere, it's just there. So those are theories. They are not actually practical. So when you go to your vessel, I suggest you just have a feel of it. Yeah. So squats. You know, uh, when I was doing my OOW orals in Southampton, you know, the first question the examiner asked me that I'm the officer of the watch. Uh, we are approaching uh, Southampton port. And there was excess, uh, I was in the bridge with the captain, and there was excess vibration, you know, on the vessel. And then the captain asked me to go and check what is happening at stand. And I find out that there is form of discoloration of water. So he asked me uh, what could have been the possible cause. And straight away I told him it's a uh, squat. And thereafter he started to ask me about uh, what is squat. What are the characteristics of squats? And then uh, he asked me that if a vessel have a block coefficient of greater than 0 0.7 meters, uh, how does it squat by head or by stem? So, and I was lucky enough that I read it in a mariner's handbook. So I was able to answer him. So squat is very, very important, not for the purpose of oral examination, but uh, for the purpose of our career, you should be able to know uh, when squat happen, what can actually happen? It can result in grounding of the vessel. You know, it can result in damaging the propellers and rudder. So it's very, very important. So what is squat per se? Squat, you know, is a bodily sinkage of uh, a vessel, you know, when making way, you know, and it's almost noticed in uh, shallow waters, you know. Squat is almost noticed in shallow waters. So for instance now, uh, you have, uh, per se, a nine meter uh, draft uh, vessel, you know, and when you are moving in shallow water, you should be able to calculate, there are some formulas you calculate for squat, there should be bodily sinking. So the draft definitely is going to increase. So meaning that the depth of water is going to reduce. So when the depth of water reduces, the draft is going to increase. So here I have a vessel of, from the depth of water is 10 meter, and then when it's squatting, the depth of water is nine meters, so you can see. So it's very, very important as an officer of the watch when going to port, we should be able to calculate and make allowance for squat. If you go through your uh, passage planning or navigational checklist, there's an allowance for squat. And if you are participated in SAR inspections, you should know that the SAR inspector, when he's looking at the navigational aspect of the vessel, he tends to look at the squad calculated and things like that, he tends to look. So that is how critical squad is. And you should not be able to know that one of the major emergencies is grounding. So squad can actually lead to grounding. So 
What are the causes of squat? So, causes of squat is just as uh, water displaced creates an increase in current velocity and it passes through the hull and causes reduction in pressure, which results to, to uh, this reduction in water level. You know, it's just how to do with water pressure because as the hull is moving into the water, you know, it creates a pressure around the hull. So what happened at that point that it leads to reduction in water level. And once the water level reduced, that means the vessel is going to sink uh, more. And when they sink more, you know, the underkill clearance is going to reduce. So it's very, very important for you to know uh, uh, squat. So it's same thing as we talk, as the ship uh, proceeds through the water, you know, she pushes the water ahead and she pushes the water ahead in order not to leave any hole in the water, this volume of water must return down, you know, and must return down to the bottom of the ship. You know, the streamline of return flow spread over the ship and it caused a vertical drop in water pressure, which results in dropping of vertical water along the ship side. So it always happens along the ship side. So it's very, very important for you to know this. So when it causes that drop in water level, it also causes the vessel to sink the more. When it causes the vessel to sink the more, what happens is the draft of the vessel is going to increase the, and the underkill clearance of the vessel is going to reduce. So if you are in a confined water, let's say you are in bony channel and you have, a, let's say the charter depth is about 18 meters and you loaded a tanker to maybe 17 to five meters, and when you calculate the squat using, because you calculate there's a formula for squat and you have to take into account of the block coefficient of the vessel. It's very, very important because squat takes into account of the shape of the vessel, you know? So you take into account of the block coefficient of the vessel and calculate the squat. And you find out that the increase in squat is maybe uh, 0 0.8 or 0 0.7, meaning you can't be able to sail. So you should tell the captain you can't be able to sail until maybe you look at the high water, what's the high water, you know, before you can be able to sell. You have to be able to, some companies have requirement for, uh, for underkill clearance. So you must be able to meet up that requirement for underkill clearance before selling. There is no point of you selling and you have the effect of squad in a narrow channel and you run the ship aground. Sometimes when you run the ship aground, you know the consequence might lead to uh, spillage, you know, it, the reputation of the company it might lead to equipment damage. You know, sometimes the vessel might be able to sink because it's taking in water that's flooding. So it's very, very important for you to know uh, and understand uh, squat. So as we discuss, as the vessel is moving forward, you know, there's water pressure, as you can see, high pressure here. And as it's coming, it's coming through the side of the vessel. It causes low pressure, which brings about the bodily uh, sinkage of the particular vessel. So the water is moving faster under the hull in a shallow water. So you might ask as well, look at uh, what we call the Benoli's uh, theorem. This is purely uh, Benoli's uh, theory is about squat. And this happened mostly in uh, congested and uh, shallow uh, waters. So, and what happened is there are two components of a squat. You have the mean bodily uh, sinkage and change in trim. So you can either squat by head or by uh, stand. And sometimes if you look, a vessel that have a block coefficient of more than 0 0.7 meters, it tend to squat by head. So it's very, very important for you to know, to know that. So we have discussed about squat now. So what are the effects of squat? Because as you can see, squad is very critical and it can lead to navigational catastrophe, especially when you are navigating in a narrow channel. It's very, very important for you to take into account of uh, squad. So one of the effects of squad is the reduction in undertail clearance. And reduction in undertail clearance per se now is going to, it can lead to grounding of a vessel when you don't have sufficient UTC. If you sell a vessel maybe from port to pilot station, you don't take account of on the kill clearance, and then you tend to move, you know, at a slightly faster speed. The faster you move, the more uh, bodily sinkage the vessel is, is going to cause a lot of squat and 
the consequence might be our grounding. So it's very, very important for you to know that there is reduction on the key occurrence. Another thing uh, about squat, as you can see in the previous picture, is about increased weight making just ahead of the bow because of the water pressure. So it's going to increase uh, the wave just ahead of the bow. So before I mention this uh, point three, I hope all of us knows what is called by uh, sea suction, you know, or what we, you call a sea chest in a vessel. You know, if you're in a vessel, there is a ballast sea chest and there's an engine room sea chest. Some vessel have what we call the high sea chest and some vessel have the low sea chest. And uh, the cargo sea, uh, the ballast sea chest is where you take in ballast water, you know, for ballasting, you know, and then you have an overboard discharge valve for the ballasting. And you also have what we call the machinery uh, sea suction, where all the cooling waters, you know, for your machinery, you need to take it up. If you're an LNG carrier, you know, you have a sea suction for your compressors, motor rooms, you know, it's very, very important. So what are the effects of, so, uh, uh, effect of squat? Effect, squat can actually cause a uh, blockage of this particular sea suction sea chest. And you should you know that when it is blocked, particularly when the machineries are running, they don't have cooling waters. Take for example, your engine. Can your engine be able to run without water and a radiator? Absolutely no, it's going to lead to catastrophe. So it's very, very important. That's one of the reasons why you need to understand how uh, squat affects vessel operation. So it's very, very important because it can have a serious consequence on the machinery of the vessel. So that is the effect of squat. Second one is uh, reduction in, in shift speed for similar inputs of engine. So for instance, now when you are going on this slow ahead and you know that at this slow ahead, you should be able to be making five knots, but because of squat, you can't be making five knots. It's going to cause you reduction in speed. You might be making three knots or 2.5, or even uh, sometimes maybe you can make four knots. So you can reduce uh, your speed for the same input of uh, engine uh, power. As I've discussed before I start uh, these lectures about discoloration of water. So when you look at when the vessel is, uh, is under the influence of squat, you can look at one of the signs is a discoloration of water. You know, instead of you having maybe a blue water, you'll be having a brown niche water, it's discoloration of water. You know, another one is reduction in revolution of propeller because the propeller is continuing to get stuck, like I said earlier. So it's very, very important for you to know. And it's not only reduction in uh, propeller revolution, it's also going to cause damages to the propeller. It's very, very important for you to know uh, that. So another one is the vibration of uh, sea condition, which I've discussed earlier about the question I was asked in my oral. So you can actually feel the impact of vibration. And you know, when the vessel is vibrating, what happened? A lot of loose items, you know, will be all over the place. It can cause some equipment damages. So it's very, very important for you to know uh, this one. Sluggish in maneuvering. That's one of the first characteristics. You know, when you are giving him orders, and is not responding and you are having sufficient speed, you should be able to anticipate is an effect of squat. And when you have sluggish maneuvering, meaning that you can't be able to respond to any emergency or any unforeseen circumstance since that is happening to you. So it's very, very important for you to know uh, this uh, effects of uh, squat. So increase in resistance. So there will be resistance, you know, to maneuvering the vessel, you know, those, it's very, very important. So when you are trying to, maybe you are, the vessel is going to pull, you are trying to control it to starboard, but the effect of squad will be able, will give you a lot of resistance. You can't be able to counter it. So it's very, very important for you to know uh, that. So we have talked about uh, squads and uh, let me see the time. Yes, we can be able to talk briefly about uh, interaction. You know, so uh, as you are aware, like we discussed earlier, there has been issues of interaction where ships are involved in collision. You know, some ships have to, some ships will block channels like the issue of ever given that just happened. You know, some ships also have also run aground in banks, you know, during pilotage due to the effect of interaction. But before I proceed with interaction, 
how will you be able to reduce squat? Very, very important. Uh, this is a question to all of us in the house. Any, anybody that can be able to answer this for us, how do you reduce uh, squat? Uh, reduction of uh, squat. I think when you are approaching an arrow channel, you reduce speed. You go at the minimum speed available, then slow ahead, for instance. Excellent. That is a good answer, yes. A reduction of speed. When a vessel is uh, under the influence of squat, the first action you take is to uh, reduce uh, speed. Very, very important. But before then, uh, like we discussed during uh, ship handling is you must be able to have a plan. Very, very important. Planning is very, very important. Before doing anything, you must have a plan. You must anticipate that uh, the vessel will squat. So, and you must be able to make allowance for that particular squat. Even if you reduce speed to BRS minimum, there are still some, uh, as the ship is moving forward, the water pressure will still cause, but that is the right answer is reduction of speed. You know, thank you very much for that. Anybody that has any contribution? Any question uh, regarding uh, squats? Oh, hello, sir. Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, I just want to ask, um, what's the difference between um, um, squat or is it the same thing as a, a vessel smelling ground? Vessel? Smelling ground. I've had that term. I don't understand. Smelling ground. I don't think that is a maritime terminology. It's squat is squat because smelling ground. How do you spell it? Smelling. No more smelling. Smelling. Yeah, well, uh, it's not a terminology. It's not a proper seamanship terminology. So the proper one is squat. So I can't be able to tell you that it's the same thing because I have not had vessel smelling ground in my in the course of my study or in the course of my career because I was sailing before then I am now pilot so more a master pilot so I've not had vessel smelling ground or oh, maybe JJ can define yeah. I mean explain what this smelling ground is there we can um, say the terminology used. Uh, you, know, you know, from the, sorry, I don't know if it's terminology, as you said, but it's um, common, um, um, can I say, it's a common language I've been hearing, uh, um, no, every time, you know, like. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, so you, you have to be very, that. very careful in, uh, in the course of your oral examination. Yeah. Or, when you have to use different terminologies because you might be able to dig a big hole for yourself, you know? So the exam, you might say the right thing, but the examiner will say that you lack the knowledge. So there are some terminologies we use. For instance, now, if you go to major, most of the oil majors, they say toolbox talk for risk assessment. I believe you might have heard that. But if you go on the, on the, on the, on the no, risk management, there's nothing like toolbox. You know, it's risk assessment, you know. So it's very, very important for you to use the right uh, phrase or the right terminology, you know. So any other Hello, question? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Um, sir, when it comes to this um, squat reduction, could the ballasting work? Well, uh, the ballasting, I will say it won't work. You will consider the ballasting before going into the narrow channel. When you are going into the narrow channel now is, when I was a second mate, I will be able to calculate squat at different speeds. We have squat tables, right? So I know my uh, draft, I know the charted depth, I know the underkill clearance, I know that if I'm going at eight note, if I squat, I will still have sufficient on the kill clearance. So, but if I will not have, and we need to sell out of the port, then you will consider the ballasting before even uh, before selling. 
you know, because what happened is this, the vessel is keep sinking, you know, but if you reduce speeds, you know, it's going to come up. It's not about maybe increasing the balance or reducing the balance. So it's very, very uh, crucial. You will consider the ballasting if you will not have sufficient on the keel clearance before leaving the port, in my opinion. But there is no, uh, you know, right answer regarding that. But the best, the best answer that you can give your examiner is speed reduction because squat is associated with the speed of the vessel. Okay, thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Is there any other question before we move to interaction briefly? Okay, so uh, interaction is very, like I said, it's very important. So as you are aware, increase in water speed results to uh, decrease in water pressure. Uh, same like what we discussed during our uh, squats. So uh, when you are moving, as you are increasing water speed, you should be able to know that you have a high positive pressure near the bow. You know, as you can see here, this is a vessel, you know, and then you have a negative uh, pressure, you know, uh, near a midship. And through the stain also, because of the water pressure, you also have another positive uh, pressure. Uh, the reason why you have uh, a positive pressure at the bow is because there's an increased pressure flow of water. You have the bubbles bar is going, you know, uh, the more the, the pressure is, is much exerted at the bow and then it's reduced amidships and then at the stem because of the propeller wash again you have more pressure increased pressure at the stem you know so uh, those are the causes uh, we're going to look at the cause of interaction now so there's interaction between uh, vessels and basically what interaction means that, uh, as I mentioned, you have positive pressure at the bow, positive pressure as a stain, and the immediate is negative pressure. So uh, when you have a vessel that is overtaking another vessel, you know the positive pressure at the bow and the positive pressure at the stain may cause them to repel, whereas it can cause uh, a form of collision during overtaking, you know, I'll show you now. And also during, uh, when you are in a narrow channel, you know, there's also pressure at the bank and you also have a positive pressure at the bow. But because of our time uh, constraint, we won't be able to talk about the bank. I'll just discuss one scenario, then we continue next week with the other scenario. So interaction between vessels uh, can arise from changes in the pressure field surrounding the vessels when they pass close by, like I said, during overtaking interaction. Some examiners can ask you uh, when do interaction occur in vessels? So you can say, okay, interaction can occur during overtaking, interaction can occur during head on situation, or interaction can also occur when the vessel is at bed and another person is passing very close. Interaction can also occur at narrow channel in a bank. So it's straightforward you know so now the pressure field you know pattern around a vessel you know with headway is shown here you know you can see when you are making it like i say you have a positive pressure at the bow a reduced pressure at midship and a positive pressure uh a stem so positive pressures they are all in the bow now in the case of overtaking you know, when a vessel is overtaking, we'll look at how the effect of interaction, how interaction occurs during overtaking. So let's take the first phase. What happened next? You can see the first the vessel that has been overtaken is the one in the blue. So they all have positive pressures at the bow. This one, the one that is on this way is have positive pressure at the stem. So what happened, like I said, you know, the positive pressure here, the flow speeds up in the gap, you know, the pressure quotient at the bow. So what happened now is the positive pressure now will tend to go to the other positive pressure and the bow is going to go the other way. And once the bow go in the other way, the positive pressure tend to attract to each other, you know, and when the bow, sorry, I just end the slide. When the bow go to the stand, what happened now is it causes collision. 
So you look at the flow of water here, there's positive at the bow, and midship now there's negative, as then there's positive. And the vessel coming now there's positive. So the starboard quarter and the starboard bow will come together, they will attract each other, you know, and what will happen, they will cause the vessel to share during overtaking. And once they cause the vessel to share during the overtaking, the port bow of the overtaking ship will overlap the starboard quarter of the other vessel. And when it overlap, what will happen now, it will result in collision. That is why it's very, very important for you to know that. And what, what you need to do in this particular situation before overtaking, you need to reduce your speed because everything has to, uh, to be done in an orderly manner. So you need to reduce your speed. You need to consider giving some kind of uh, safe distance because the more you reduce your speed, the more the water pressure around the bow is reduced, which tend to reduce also the positive pressure around the bow. But if you go at the fast speed, like I say, the starboard quarter, which is has a positive pressure, you know, and also uh, the port bow, which also have the positive pressure, they are going to uh, come together, you know. When they come together now, the vessel is going to shed. And when it's shed, you can see it here, it's going to shed. And when it's shed towards the starboard quarter, what happens now is leads to collision. And it's going to have a collision, serious collision between the port bow and the starboard quarter of the other vessel. And as you are aware, the starboard quarter of the other vessel, that is where the engine room is located, you know. And sometimes you might have the fuel and bunker tanks. What will result? It result in uh, pollution and major speed. So it's very, very important for you to know this. And again, when a vessel is on head-on situation, now in head-on situation, now you have positive pressure at the bow and positive pressure in the other bow. And what happens now? They also tend to attract to each other. And when they attract to each other, they cause the vessel to shed. When they cause the vessel to shed, you know, it can lead to collision as well. So the other scenario is also the positive pressure at the bank when the pilot is going very fast, you know, it can cause the vessel, you know, the positive pressure at the bow, you know, to attract the positive pressure at the bank, which sometimes can lead to the complete blockage of channel and can lead to grounding, you know. So the third scenario is when the vessel is moored alongside and another vessel is passing, it's ideal for you to reduce your speed. Because it can even lead, sometimes this positive pressure can lead to the vessel that is being moored for the mooring lines to be to, to part. There has been a lot of uh, incident reports that have been reported regarding that about interaction. So I think in the next class, because we are running out of time, it's already nine o'clock now. I'm going to talk in detail about interaction because interaction and squat, they always go hand in hand. And there's also a comprehensive NGN you know, that talks about interaction. There's also an NGN that talks about uh, squad. So as a navigating officer, you can be asked question about interaction. How do interaction occur when you are overtaking, which I've just explained. Interaction can also occur, you know, when you are on head-on collision. Interaction can also occur when you are in a narrow channel. Interaction can also occur when a vessel is moored alongside another vessel is passing by in the vicinity. So it's very, very important. And you should know that the result of collision can lead to serious catastrophe, can lead to deaths, you know, loss of uh, primary containment, you know, et cetera. So it's very, very important for you to have a good knowledge of uh, interaction. So uh, I think we are running out of time, you know, we are running out of time, but I have a question for you. Uh, is not a rule of the road question. So a vessel that is approaching a narrow channel, you know, going uh, at a speed of, let's say, uh, 10 knots or 15 knots. So what are the precautions that as officer of the watch you need to take while approaching uh, a narrow channel? You are approaching at a speed of 10, 15 knots, but when entering the channel, what are the precautions that you are supposed to take? And why are you taking such a uh, precaution? This is not a rule of the road question about a narrow channel. And mind you, there is no definition of narrow channels as per rules of the road. So we have to be careful. I've been asked this question in aura, so that's why I'm asking this question. Any idea? Anybody?
officers? What are the precautions? What are the actions that you need to mm. take before entering a narrow channel? Okay, I will, Can I, I will answer it. Can I nominate? Okay. I can nominate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, everybody almost let's let's hear let's because honestly, this is also a question that you know they asked me in my I remember in my chief mates orals, and I was just looking for for the answer. So the more you start practicing with these answers, the more confidence you are uh, you, you are. Um I'm seeing one Captain Henry here. Um please let's let's know you, let's see, let's hear what you say. And Aruna, love it. Let's let's hear what you say. What are we gonna be doing? You're on the bridge, you are coming in from from 10 knots. Narrow channel. Good evening, sirs. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Um sir, first of all, um uh, I think you want to know the traffic density of the channel, like if there's any other how many other vessels probably coming out or mm. also going in. Mm. Yeah, then, uh I think you'd also want to uh, first of all you'd have want to check the um the depth of the channel. I don't know. Then yes, yeah. um, maybe reduce the speed. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so I'll keep, the I'll, I'll keep a safe speed in them rather keep a safe speed. Mm. Safe speed in the sense like like um um like you like like you said you you know the crisis of your vessel, like the um Tony Lever and um ability to stop, like man maneuverability. So you want mm. to know okay, if you're on 10 knots or 15 knots, like how easy can you handle the vessel before entering um a narrow channel if it's something you could actually maintain that knot or reduce it. Um I think I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have done well. Yes, it's good. Thank you, sir. Yes, but uh, in addition to what she has said, you have done well. It's really a good uh, answer. So before going into <coughs> narrow channel, uh, you have to ensure that your steering gear is tested. We are going to discuss steering gear because it's a very serious crisis. If they ask you in your oral exam. That's where the examiner is going. You have to ensure that your steering gear is tested. You have both steering motor. You know, you are approaching a narrow channel, as she has said, you have a lot of traffic density. So the master should be called to be on the bridge. You know, you should consider reducing the speed, proceed at safe speed, and then he might ask you what is safe speed. And she has already defined uh, safe speed, the speed that you should be able to stop, you know, within the shortest distance as possible. You know, you should be able to take into account of the effect of squats and interaction. You know, basically that is uh, what they also want to know. And also your ability, you know, to know one of the, if, one of the things that affect vessels and sometimes you might misunderstand it with squat is the effect of uh, all this tidal stream, you know, in a narrow channel. You know, so you also have to talk to him that you are going to look at the weather forecast, look at the effect of the tidal stream, how it's been uh, flowing, you know, you know, the effect of currents, you know, which might affect it, even wind, because uh, in respect of in narrow channel, you still have wind, it's not going to be zero wind. And sometimes wind also helps you than zero wind. I love to bet the ship when I have wind and when there's nothing. So it's very, very important for you to know that communication is also key. Uh, you, are, you must have your plan at hand and what to do. So I think uh, you, she has done well. So I don't know if anybody have uh, any question regarding uh, ship handling, squad and interaction. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask compassion. Okay. Yeah. As regards to entering into this narrow channel, can we also say, maybe if we were in autopilot before, we can switch over to maybe manual? Excellent, that is, yes. yes. Then yes. What about yes. also preparing our anchor for emergency let go? Definitely, yeah, it's a good one, yes. 
Then what if you have also trusters, like bow trusters and stent trusters? Since you're entering into narrow channel, can we get them radios to for emergency use? He might ask you at what speed will a bow truster be effective? So you have to be careful when mentioning bow truster. Because if you look at solar, <laughs> okay. bow truster is not, if you go to solar under a list of navigation equipment, uh, bow truster is not there. And it's not a requirement for ships, okay. so you have to be careful. All right, sir. All right. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. So any other question? Yeah, but I think it's, um, it's really lovely um, today. I'm just going to... I'm just going to try and pick someone to just try and help us. Um, Timitoko, are you there? If you can, there you can unmute your mic. Yeah, what I just want to, I want to ask is, there are sometimes when we get to exam and uh, I think, yeah, that was before I even left school. I mean, while I was still a cadet was, now what's the difference between squats and uh, an interaction? And yeah, there is, a, there is a very big difference, but also there are some um, similarities. So is anybody gonna now try to explain to us what's the difference now between squats and interaction? I have so many quiet people in the house here. Yeah. Um, compassion, you wanna help us out here? Yeah? Mm. Well, <laughs> since there's no one, I will I will really answer the question. But as as we can um, really see it, interaction has really like Captain Caleb has tried to help us to to understand. It's it has got to deal with closeness of one versus to another, and it's deal with the positive and the negative um, the pause coming from the vessels. Whereas squat is it's a bodily sinkage. So it is not like the vessel is, is grounding, it's a bodily sinkage um, of the vessels um, going down um, themselves. So we've been having, I mean, for for all the obvious questions, sometimes it gets to that point. And there's a question Captain Caleb asked also, which was, um, what do you do as regards to squats when you are coming into narrow channel? Um, the answer was was correct, but as regard to to squats, we might not go into um, autopilot to, to to manual. What he wants to, what the examiner also wants to try and get to know is, do you understand um, what we are saying? As I mean, you understand the effect of squat and interaction. So, majorly the the answers, of course, will be like Captain Keller tried to let us know is um, slowing down your speed, which is the similar solution to to both of them uh, which is the squat and the and the interaction so yeah thanks captain Caleb and um, thanks to everybody that um that attended um I think this will be someone is raising up mm his -hmm. hand here Emma Green uh, did I get the name right yeah you can almost yourself and let's know your name okay um good evening sirs my name is Emmy Gray Emmy Gray all right Yes, sir. Um, so I just want to know what's the what's the minimum speed for the bow thrusters to be effective? About five knots. Okay. It Thank is you. not effective when the speed is more than five knots. It's not okay. effective. Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Yes. Yeah, for the for the bow thrusters, even some bow thrusters, I mean they always put it right there. Um, I was trying on my supply um, versus, well, I know 
they put sometimes four, four knots. So it's kind of, you know, but maximum five, I'm not sure you're going to be having any um, reason for you to test your bow thruster because it's not going to be effective um, as well. Yeah, can we join up? Good evening, Captain. Good evening. The, I want to ask them, considering the interaction, we are talking about the positive and the negative interactions. Above this, the Sorry, can you be more audible? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm hearing. Thank you. Am I clear now? Loud and clear. Okay. Considering interactions, I want to ask the interactions is. I believe it, is it um, size sensitive considering the size of the vessels that are passing each other? Like if you're having a vessel of like 200 meters and you're having another vessel of like, let me say 50 meters, are the interactions going to be that very, um, the pulses, are they going to be similar or it has to be do with the sizes of the vessels being almost the same for the interactions to bring them to a close quarter situation or almost collision. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. So uh, the interaction, when you talk about the size of the vessel uh, and a big vessel or a small vessel, first of all, the interaction is being decided by your flow speed. You know, the faster you go, you know, the flow speed, you have the positive pressure. So when you have a big vessel, yes, you should expect uh, when you have the positive pressure at the bow and the positive pressure at the stern, and then when the bow and the stern of a small and big vessel comes together, you should effect, expect that the effect will be catastrophic, you know, because uh, it's a big and a small ship. But irrespective of size of the ships, interactions still occur in a narrow channel when you are passing close by. Sometimes there is even interaction between tugboat and a big crude oil tanker. So it's very, very crucial. So what you need to tell the examiner is uh, it depends on the flow speed, you know, is flow speed and pressure. You know, it's not, uh, you should not even start to talk about the size of the ship and things like that. Yes, when interaction occur in a bank and a ship is big, like what happened ever given, you can see, you know, the struggle that is struggle to flood the ship after a long period of time, you know. So, yes, size have an effect, but the major causes of interaction is not the size of the ship, but is the uh, flow speed of water and the water pressure displaced by the vessel. Are you clear with that? Do you, do you understand that, Kevin? Yes, thank you so much. That was fantastic, sir. All right. I have a question, sir. Yeah, okay. yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay, this interaction, uh, does it only occur in, um, in narrow channels? Because sometimes if you are having a ship um, passing you head on, port to port, um, what is the force that exists? Because sometimes you see the water wash pushing you. Out. Is there is there any um, interactive forces when we have um, um, when we have a vessel that you are passing port to port? Yes, uh, interaction. Like I said, it occurs in different scenarios. Uh, this overtaking occurs in narrow channel as well. It occurs in at open sea when you are passing very close to each other. You know, when you are passing, it's, it occurs. You can be passing at 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 miles very close to each other. You should expect there's a pressure there. But mostly, why mostly these things have been discussed for ship handling. It occurs, we are talking about narrow channel and congested water. Because in open sea, okay. you might be passing ship at 0 0.2 cables, 0 0.3 cables, 0 0.5 overtaking. But in congested waters, You'll be overtaking vessel at sometimes uh, 0 0.5, you know, uh, nautical miles, 0 0.3. So that's where why interaction is more pronounced, you know, in congested water. You know, this is congested water. And in narrow channel, the interaction also occurs between the vessel and the bank, 
you know, while all this one occurs in congested, but in open sea, yes, it can occur, but, you know, because of the distance you are passing the vessel in open sea, you will not feel it is insignificant. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Done. Thanks to Captain Caleb as well. So yeah. without thanks everyone, and uh, we'll see you again Tuesday, same time, same place. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Uh. Thank you. And Bye. the video will thank be you. on YouTube as well. So.